Hello everyone. I am very excited today to introduce you to Josh Wilson, the creator, the mind behind Always Ready, which is a real cool nifty little AI voice assistant powered by large language models. I did a video on it just yesterday. I'll drop the link to it in video description plus the repo of Josh is Always Ready. Please do visit it. Josh is based in Tasmania, Australia which is another state. I'm based in Sydney, New South Wales in Australia. So we are very close location wise. And Josh is quite uh, passionate about integrating advanced AI generative AI into gaming experiences too. So let's chat with Josh about his. A uh, few more things. Josh, firstly, thanks a lot for joining us today. Can you please tell us about your background how you got started in the field of AI and tech? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk. Um, yeah, so I've been passively interested in AI since the early days. Um, I'm not sure if you remember GANs, the, um, those first models that could kind of generate images probably five or six years ago now. Um, when I saw those, I was very excited, but I didn't have the technical know-how to, to get my hands on with them. And then I discovered PT3 when the uh, OpenAI made their API public and it just blew my mind. I'd never seen a language model before. I had never heard of language modeling before, um, but that was kind of the point for me that I realized that I really wanted to, to get my hands dirty and get involved with these things. So I started to learn to program and started to play around with, um, with the models a bit, um, a lot of, a lot of calls to the OpenAI API. Um, and at the same time, I had a, a hobby for game development with my younger brother. We'd been using Unreal Engine to make little demos and prototypes of games. So at uh, some point we decided to kind of mesh the two and we made a few simple little video game prototypes where like the NPCs would talk to you with natural language and So it was just like a flood of uh, people with blown minds, um, which was very exciting to see. Um, so yeah, we from there, we started consulting to a few different game development companies. That's my day job. I work with game development companies um, integrating in generative AI. We um, make cool NPCs, try to make uh, good dialogue. And uh, I'm a big fan of Skyrim, um, uh, the NPCs in Skyrim. So I would love to make a game kind of like that one day that really feels alive and the NPCs feel like they're actually actually there. Um, and then, yeah, um, since then I've had lots of little side projects, um, including Always Ready. I just tinker away whenever I'm not doing game development work. But yeah, that's pretty much my backstory. Awesome. So that is quite quite a lot, actually. And <laughs> so which year was GPT-3, by the way? When did you first tinkered with it? Um. I'm t I have a terrible sense of uh, time, but it would have been three years ago, I think. Um, okay, so when hardly anyone knew about GPTs and models, right? I remember when I first discovered it, I was so excited that I was Googling GPT-3 everywhere. I was Googling large language models. I couldn't find anything about them. Like no one was talking about them. I even had a Google alert set for any post talking about large language models and it would go off like once a month or something that someone would write a blog post. And then I had to stop it recently because it was just going off like hundreds of times a day. <laughs> That's very interesting. So tell us more about this Always Ready. Firstly, what's the name Always, Always Ready and what exactly inspired you to create this? Uh, so the name's a fun one. Um, <laughs> so, I play I play a lot of a game called Counter Strike with my younger brothers, and at one point my youngest brother was asking if I was ready to play Counter Strike, and he misspelled uh, "ready" as R E D D Y, and ever since then we kind of ran with it. And whenever we're messaging to see if anyone wants to play a game together, we'll say "Are you R E D D Y?" and it just became a bit of a running gag in my family to spell <laughs> "ready" like that. Um, and I kind of decided that if I ever got the chance to use it in a product name uh, or any name, for, um, I would use it just for the fun. And uh, Always Ready seemed like a good name for this product. So 
pretty. Um, I remember when GPT, I got the email and looked at it straight away. And um, yeah, my brother and I said it together and we weren't. Um, from the, our first impressions of it, it didn't seem like a big jump in front of the other language models that we'd used. It didn't seem like a big jump in front of like um, GPT-3. You could use it in the playground. So my guess at that point would have, I, I never would have guessed that it would have been as successful as it was. So reflecting back on ChatGPT's insane success, I think the key to it was that it was a very frictionless interface. It was very easy for you to um, interact with it back and forth. You didn't have to mess with prompting it. Before that, you used to have to try to set up a prompt just to be able to chat with the model. Um, so I think the real key part of ChatGPT's success, at least initially, was reducing friction between users and language models. And I wanted to take that to an extreme where you don't even have to open an app on your computer or go to the browser. You don't have to type anything. You just have to press a button and you can talk to it. So that's kind of the, the thesis behind Always Ready. Got it. That's that's amazing. Now let's talk a bit, you know, technical about Always Ready. Uh, could you just throw some light on what exactly you are using behind the scene? What is a language? If that is not a uh, secret, of course. If there is a trade secret, no need <laughs> to tell us. But if you could just tell us some technology behind this. Yeah. Um, so it's all open source. So there's no secrets. You can go ahead and use the code for whatever you want. Um, I'm still reasonably new to programming, and um, so I, I used Python to put it together. Um, at the moment, it uses the the first iteration of it was entirely using OpenAI's API, so it was using Whisper for the uh, transcription, uh, GPT 3.5 or GPT 4 um, for the text generation, and then OpenAI also have a an API endpoint for generating speech. Um, so Originally, it was just those three, um, and now I've just added extra language model support, so you can use Anthropic, and now just yesterday I added support for local, um, so you, you can point to your own local models. Uh, yeah, so that that's basically the technology behind it, but hopefully that will rapidly expand over the next few weeks as I add new integrations and things. Awesome. Do you have a plan to add any GUI on top of it? That's something I'm wondering about. Um, I'd like to be able to work on this project as much as I can. So I'm wondering about having um, maintaining the code base as an open source project and hopefully building a community that builds on top of it. And then as a side, building a, uh, a paid front end. So just a one click installer where people can pay I'm thinking between five and $12, just something really cheap, a one-time payment, um, just enough to like pay for the, simplicity of having a one-time installer. And if the open source community may want to make their own versions, then that's fine. Um, but that could allow me to generate a little bit of income so I could justify spending more time on the project. But that's still early days. Awesome. Okay, so um, you, so one thing which is, you know, strikes me very interesting is that you mentioned that you are not a developer or programmer. In So, so, but you said that you already are working with some of the game development companies. So how does that work? So are you a graphic designer or what? How exactly one builds NPC and pardon my ignorance there? Yeah, so we've done, most of the jobs we've done with um, game studios have been largely R&D. Um, so there are a lot of large studios that are just curious about using generative AI in their games. I think everyone from every industry is curious about how AI make it for them. Um, but my main job that I work um, that I work on is probably more of a classic game designer where I'm uh, I, I'm mostly programming NPCs and that kind of thing, but the company's only new so I'm doing all sorts of odd jobs and I'm learning on the well, that is fine. That is all good. Now towards then um, I want to ask you something that a lot of people uh, especially in IT 
who are in the cloud or developers and DevOps, they are still very confused as how to start in generative AI or AI. What would your advice be for the beginners or the professionals who are already in their career? How to adapt to this new field? Yeah, I think um, I think it's the same as anything else, and you learn about it just by using it and doing it. So um, open up Python, open up a notebook, and just start making some. Connect yourself to one of the APIs and just start playing with it. Get an intuition for what it does. Um, uh, looking through Reddit is a great idea as well. Looking through the local Llama subreddit, it's highly technical, so it's probably scary for people who. Uh, well, it's scary for me most of the time, but it's scary for people who are not at that depth, but you'll get to see lots of different things that people are hacking together and you'll get an idea hopefully pretty quickly of what's possible and what's not. Makes sense. Well, Josh, thank you very much for your time today. I really loved you know, talking to you. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> no worries. Thank you.